comes into the attendees section. And we'll wait for that to happen for a little bit before we get started. All right, Mandy, we're recording. Thank you. I am not seeing anyone pop into Zoom attendees. Giving it a little bit. So, um, okay. Okay. So, um, seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling this special meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order at 4.31 p.m. on June 12th, 2023. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting is conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone, and no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. So you will happen to know if you're out, oh, this meeting is also being recorded. Um, I'm going to, in a minute, take attendance to make sure everyone can hear and be heard. Um, and I will do that also for our applicants to the planning board so that we've made sure everyone all at once can and we don't have to do that multiple times. Um, once I do that, uh, uh, and I will explain how this meeting will work in terms of the uh, interview of applicants. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to note that you might notice that three of our members are sitting in the town room right now, um, because right after this meeting is a council meeting. Um, and so for transportation purposes, they are attending remotely from the council room. Uh, I'm going to have to rely on them to indicate if anyone from the public shows up so that we can deal with that since we have noticed that we're not going to have in-person attendance of the public. Um, we will figure that out if that happens. Um, I thought it might be easier, but we'll see. Um, so uh, otherwise, it's generally a Zoom meeting, but we do have three people in the same room and their audio is being controlled through the town room audio so that we don't have weird feedback. Um, so that's why you see a town room video and a town room um, attendee. Uh, with that, I'm now going to take uh, a roll call vote of committee members, and then I will also call the names of our three applicants. If everyone can indicate that they are present when they hear their name, that will confirm that people can hear and be heard. We're going to start with Shalini. Present. Um, Pat. Present. Mandy is present. Uh, Pam Rooney. I'm here. And Jennifer Taub. Present. Thank you. And our three applicants are Frederick Hartwell. Oh, you're going to have to unmute, Frederick. There should be a button. There you go. I am present. Thank you, Frederick. Jesse Mager. Present. And Johanna Newman. Present. Thank you. That is all three applicants and all five members of our uh, Community Resources Committee. Um, at this time, we're going to move on to the interview of applicants. Um, the way this is going to work is um, I, we, the CRC previously adopted interview questions. They have been forwarded to all applicants ahead of time so that they know what they are. They will be asked in the order they were forwarded to the applicants, but the um, response order will change and each applicant will answer each question before we move on to the next question. Um, I have forwarded a schedule to the CRC members, uh, just assigning for ease of purposes, assigning uh, who is asking each question so that we can do this fairly flowingly, and then also a response order. The response order is random. It will change who is first, second, or third for each question. Um, we will try to announce that response order before we ask the question so people can, can know which, which order they are responding in. Um, and the attempt, is, the, the goal is to give everyone a chance to answer first, second, or third as many equally as possible. It, I think we only have eight questions, so that doesn't quite equal out. But um, 
that, that way um, everyone rotates through and you're not always following the same person either. Um, after the interviews are done, um, once we've done all of the questions, I will ask the committee if there are any follow-up questions for any of the members. Each committee um, member is, is permitted to generally ask one follow-up question per each person, um, each applicant, if they wish to. So I will just start with a random applicant and see if there are any follow-up questions for that one and then move on to a different applicant and go from there, um, that is the plan. Are there any questions about the plan before we get started or how this is gonna proceed from either the committee members or the three applicants? Seeing no questions, um, we will get started then. Oh, Pam. Thank you, before we start, I would just like to say thank you for the applicants. Uh, for stepping forward and offering to uh, contribute to the town in this way. And this is not meant to be an onerous process. It's actually pretty interesting and informative. So thank you again for stepping up. Thank you for that, Pam. Um, seeing no other questions, we're going to move on to the interview questions and responses. So I'm going to ask the first one, and the order of response is going to be Frederick Hartwell, Jesse Mager, and then Johanna Newman. And this is the question, what do you feel you bring to the planning board that can make it successful? Please include any experience that you have appearing before or serving on the planning board or ZBA or watching one of their meetings. And the one thing I forgot is you'll have up to three minutes to answer the question. So I'm going to run the timer. Um, and try to have it loud enough that it runs through my mic when it goes off so people can hear it, but that's not a guarantee. Um, and I don't have the fancy timer Athena has, so I, I will see if I can find a way to indicate there's like 30 seconds left, but that might take me a couple of people to figure that out. Okay, having said that, Frederick Hartwell, you are first. Thank you. Uh, I think the main thing is that uh, I have uh, about uh, six and a half years experience on the planning board. Uh, I uh, served in the uh, late 1990s and early into 2000s. And at the end of my second term, uh, my successor had not been chosen. And so I ended up carrying over for uh, a number of additional months at that point. So uh, I will hit the ground running in terms of having a pretty good idea how the planning board operates. Uh, at the time that uh, I, my understanding is the planning board right now does not have a zoning subcommittee. I'm not totally clear on how that could be the case, but it apparently is the case. I chaired the zoning subcommittee of the planning board uh, during uh, the last four years of uh, my service on the planning board. And I know a great deal about uh, the Amherst zoning bylaw and uh, have uh, written a, a number of items in it. And uh, uh, so I, I have a, a, a pretty good background in that way. I think that's the main thing that uh, I will bring to the board. Thank you, Frederick. Jesse. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jesse Major. Uh, I think you all read our statements, most likely. Um, in terms of what I can bring to the planning board, is uh, nothing like Frederick can. No experience directly. Um, but a uh, relatively long time town member. I've lived here for 16 years. Uh, I work at UMass. I live right in town. Um, a lot of the development projects and conversations and issues that have come up over the past many years, I've had tons of conversations I'm often thinking thinking about it. Um, so I do feel like I've thought deeply about some of the issues that we're uh, as a town addressing. Um, before being a scientist, I have an architecture and design background. Uh, I always had a bent towards urban planning. And so even before I thought about any real issues, when I walk around places, that's kind of what I think about is how things could get developed, how things were designed, what the intention is. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just am a big I don't plan to move. I want to be here forever. I want our town to remain vibrant and fantastic. So that, that's the perspective I would bring, I think. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Johanna. Great. 
thank you. Um, and thanks for putting this together. Um, so what do I bring to the planning board? I'm a current member of the planning board. I've uh, done one term that was three years. I am excited to do a second term. Um, so, you know, from just from being a member for the past three years, I, um, I feel like we are, we are making strides and steps towards realizing the vision of the master plan in town. There is more that needs to happen. Um, and I'm excited to spend, you know, another three years helping Amherst realize that vision by serving on the planning board. And then, um, in my professional life, I do advocacy and organizing around environmental issues. Um, so, you know, I've read the master plan numerous times, and I think a lot of that aligns with kind of my professional work doing environmental organizing and advocacy work. And so, um, insofar as I have expertise where planning and zoning meets, you know, reducing our environmental footprint, um, there's a certain amount of expertise that I bring to that space. Um, and I've lived in Amherst for 12 years. I have two kids in our public school system. My husband teaches at the university, family in Leverett. You know, I too, my life is here. I plan for my life to be here and I want the town to be a great place and I want to be part of making that happen. Not that it's great, you know, it's already great, but it can always be better. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass off the questioning to Shalini. Thank you and welcome again um, to all of you. Thank you for offering to serve. Uh, the order for answering will be for this question will be Jesse, then Johanna, and then Cedric. And the question is, tell us about an experience you've had collaborating with a group, particularly where opinions conflicted or the decision was controversial. Did everyone get that? Okay. Yeah. Um, sure. So in my part, one, one role that I play on the UMass campus is I chair the committee that approves all animal research for the whole university. Um, and the committee is comprised of about 13 people, uh, scientists, community members, a bunch of administrators, different people. And so there's often very conflicting views about um, whether certain types of experiments should be done. Um, and I've been in this role for about 10 years. And the reason I stay in the role is that it requires the ability to really manage and navigate very diverse opinions when people have very strong feelings about it. Um, and I just, I've learned I have a fairly good aptitude at balancing differing opinions and most of the time we don't end up agreeing. I think that's most cases like that where there's controversy, but as a group, you just have to end up agreeing on a path forward, even if not all the uh, people involved are 100% on board with the decision. Um, and so and it's, it's difficult and not everyone's happy at the end, um, but I, I've learned there, there's almost always a way forward that um, won't leave people feeling like they were totally dismissed. And so that, that's sort of a perspective I have on those difficult situations. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, next is Johanna. Great, thanks. Um, I love this question. Um, so I could speak to a number of experiences. The one that first came to mind for me was uh, an experience on the planning board where we were um, in the past three years where we were trying to decide whether to um, put a moratorium on solar development in Amherst. And, you know, on the one side, people felt strongly that we need to grow clean energy, that we need to lead by example. On the other side, there was concern that moving forward without a solar bylaw in place would um, disrupt beautiful open spaces, disrupt viewscapes, um, and, you know, harm our quality of life in Amherst and, you know, so anytime that there are, con I think anytime that you have an official decision-making process um, and you have to make controversial decisions where people come down on different sides, clarity of process is key. Um, 
making sure that everyone has an opportunity to make their voice heard is key. Um, and that the dialogue and the exchanges are respectful and focused on substance and not on, I don't know, ad hominem attacks or um, yeah, they just, you know, should be on substance. And I think, um, so, you know, on that particular issue, I think we, we did that. We had a clear process. Different people made their decisions. People voted. And then as a body, you know, it was, it was not, it was not a unanimous decision. We were split. So to some extent, the ability to agree to disagree and then move on, on future issues, I think is how I approach controversial decisions. Thank you, Johanna and Frederick. You're uh, up next. Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, I uh, have served on the National Electrical Code Committee. I, I am uh, an electrician by training, actually. And uh, I'm very uh, well familiar with the, the construction process and, and that sort of thing. But uh, for the last uh, 33 34 years, uh, I've been a member of the National Electrical Code Committee, Code Making Panel 9. I'm now the senior member on that panel. And uh, believe me, uh, when you start working on the next edition of the National Electrical Code, which is something that happens every three years, uh, you get uh, many hundreds of proposals uh, in from the public. Uh, a lot of them are extremely controversial, and uh, the NFPA rules are such that you don't move forward, uh, you don't change the code without uh, a consensus, which is defined generally as a two-thirds vote. And uh, yeah, you have to uh, weigh all of those uh, inputs. From, from the public and from uh, the science. You have to look at the science that's involved and uh, come to uh, an agreement that uh, uh, will uh, not, <laughs> not screw things up. Uh, often uh, the, uh, the consequences of these decisions are in terms of economic terms are huge. And uh, I've had, uh, a lot of success in doing this. So I'm also the secretary of the Massachusetts Code Committee, and we also end up having to do, weigh these these sorts of things. And uh, I have an ability to take uh, concepts and uh, create written language that uh, crafts the uh, into written language the. Uh, uh, the uh, basically the outcome of the discussion in a way that uh, can go into print. I, I do this extremely well. And uh, when you're working with zoning, for example, that is absolutely something that uh, is, uh, is important. Thank you so much, Frederick. And uh, next set of questions on to Jennifer. Yes, thank you. And I'd like to echo, um, you know, Shalini and Mandy and Pam, just to thank you so much for your willingness um, to serve, you know, our local governments uh, based on volunteers. So uh, we really um, value uh, your willingness and your participation. Okay, for my question, the order of respondents will be uh, Joanna first, and then Frederick, and then um, Jesse. And the question is, um, could you please describe how the planning board can help achieve the goals of the master plan? Joanna. Sure, thank you. Um, so there are a number of ways that the planning board can help achieve the goals of the master plan. The first is just by doing thorough review of projects that come to the pipeline and get bubbled up to the level of planning board engagement. Um, the second is actually creating zoning changes ourselves. Um, there are instances where either proposal 
or they have come from other places and come into planning board review that could include the you know the solar bylaw question um which you know relates to our master plan it could also include some of the zoning proposals that we've had like the um you know the proposal to create a 40r on the north end of kendrick park a few years ago or um for the past few months we've been considering a, a zoning proposal that has was generated by a couple of counselors that the planning board is now reviewing. And so um, there's both, I think, putting the lens, how do we know? So running that filter through the proposals that come before us um, that are both project specific, but then also policy proposals. Thank you. Um, uh, and now we'll move to Jesse. Can I interrupt for a second? Johanna, and this has happened with someone else as well. We're having trouble. There's like a freeze and then uh, it doesn't pick up. And so I, I wonder if Johanna, you could answer the last question again, because I really didn't follow your answer. Yeah. I I would say sure. it, it maybe I can stop my video yeah. for a little bit. Stop. Yeah. Should we come back to you? If you want to. I could go on to Fred if you want to maybe. Yeah. Um, zoom you, back in. I will. Sure. Um, or is, is the audio working? Because I could answer by audio and then find a different place in my home where the Internet might be more stable. Yeah, your audio is good now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Why not so I just ahead. try to answer it quickly and then I'll find a better spot so we have better connectivity moving forward. Okay, um, great. But the question is, how can the planning board achieve the goals of the master plan? And I see two primary vehicles for doing it. One is just by doing a good thorough review of the projects that come to the planning board and percolate up to the level of planning board engagement. And then the second is through policy. So the you know planning board can be the genesis of zoning amendments or changes to our zoning bylaw, and also just reviews policy. So, um, you know, for the past few months, we've been considering a adjustment to our zoning bylaw. Um, so I see those as the two key pathways that the planning board is involved in helping realize the master plan. Thank you. That was very clear. Okay, actually, um, next we'll go to Fred. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, I think uh, the uh, the main thing the, the planning board can do is by weighing uh, issues that r arise in terms of the zoning bylaw that, uh, uh, you know, you need a, a policy objective and the master plan is the policy objective generally. And um, as I indicated in, the, in my last question, one of the things that I do well is to uh, translate uh, uh, a policy discussion into uh, text. And uh, that's where the rubber meets the road, really, is the zoning bylaw. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a strength that I have. Thank you. And um, we'll go to Jesse. Thanks. Um, I'll be honest, I don't really know yet. So being new to this uh, process and the board and how all the master plan uh, and the other clues interact, uh, I can't really speak to that yet. I'm looking forward to learning how the planning board does interact and facilitate the master plan. But in the interest of time, I'll just say I'm excited to learn. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Pat for the next. Thank you. And I also want to thank all three of you for applying. Um, we're going to be looking at this question and the order of respondents will be Frederick, Johanna, and then Jesse. Um, and the question is, uh, please describe considerations and objectives you'll use for considering proposed revisions to the zoning bylaws. Um, I think the... Uh... The thing that co most comes to mind is uh, a Joni Mitchell lyric. Um, you don't know what you got till it's gone, pay paradise and put up a parking lot. Um, yeah, you've got uh, 
Amherst has a, a lot of uh, attributes to it that uh, are that could easily be threatened by, uh, frankly, current developments in the market. And uh, that, uh, I think, would have uh, a, a major, that would be a major focus of my attention during uh, any future service on the planning board. Uh, uh, it, it, we have to be so careful uh, that, uh, again, that we, uh, you know, we, we don't know what, what it's got, what we got or what we had till it's gone. Um, and, uh, and that's, uh, I, I have uh, lived in Amherst for well over 50 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, I bring a, a sense of history to this. Um, I, uh, I think, uh, let me think for a minute here. Um, yeah, um, the, uh, I think that would be the major focus. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Johanna? Great, thank you. So what considerations and objectives would I bring? I think for me, there are really four. The first is what is the perspective and opinion of the, our planning board staff? We have incredibly talented, experienced staff who guide the planning department and you know really follow these issues. And so, um, if the planning board staff say X idea or have X recommendation, I would take that into strong consideration because they're professionals. Secondly, the overlay of the master plan. So, you know, they kind of go hand in hand. Like I think the planning board staff is also always thinking about how, how will something help realize the vision of the master plan. So I expect those to be pretty well married, but I do have kind of my own analysis of the master plan as well. Thirdly, and I would be, I do think um, going into my consideration on the planning board is an element of what is needed in the world today. So we, you know, climate change is real. It's happening now. It's because we burn too many fossil fuels. Amherst historically has been a leadership community in that. That is a lens that I can't help but ideas that come before the planning board through. Um, likewise, I'm you know, aware of the need for housing in our town. Um, I get heartbroken when I talk to my kids' teachers and they're amazing people who live in Amherst, would love, or sorry, who teach in Amherst, who would love to live in Amherst and can't afford to live here, even though their kids go to school here. Like these are stakeholders and citizens that I think we want in our town. And they can't afford to live here. Um, and then thirdly, I also think about revenue. So, you know, um, we, the things that we need for our town um, to move forward and meet the challenges of the 21st century are gonna require us uh, to invest and that money has to come from somewhere. So that like climate, housing, revenue, those all fit together for me as considerations that I factor in. Um, and then lastly, the just the public dialogue around it. Uh, you know, ultimately, we're not a democratic body, but there is a, in the sense that like, um, but I, you know, but I, I listen to every public comment that's made before our body, I factor it in, where there are lots of comments, I keep tallies of, you know, how does it break down? Because um, you know, when people take the time to to show up and make their voice heard, that that carries weight. And so I factor it into my consideration and decision making. Thank you. Sorry, Jesse. No, that was me. That was interesting to hear the delay. <laughs> Johanna finished right at three minutes. <laughs> hey, Jesse. Great. Um, so I think the theme for my answer for this is really transparency. So where did the revision originate? Where did the idea originate? 
um, what's the purpose, the real purpose or intent behind the revision happening and who would then benefit from the revision, uh, which, which parties involved. Uh, what are the, the, the dynamics around those three issues? Um, and then really trying to project, okay, how would this revision, if it was granted, actually get enacted? Because a lot of times an intent does not equal how it, something is used once it's sort of in writing. Um, so I think that's how I would view our role in that process. Thank you very much, Jesse. Thank you. So my question, uh, number five is, um, and we're gonna go in the order of Jesse, Fred and Johanna. And the question is about waivers and exceptions. So what's your opinion of waivers, exceptions and special permits in the zoning bylaw? When, they sh when should they be used and when should they not be used? So we'll go with Jesse first. Sure. Um, so every rule is meant to be broken, right? That's the idea. Um, I think same, similar to what I just said, I think it's really about trying to figure out what's the real purpose, like why the exception would be needed uh, and what the benefit is. And it's just weighing the pros and cons of allowing a deviation to whatever you know, the rule is we're talking about. Um, I'm sure we all have scores of examples where yes, an exception is needed for whatever status quo you're talking about. Um, but that's the purpose of a board, right? Is to decide and weigh the pros and cons. Um, so those, I think, obviously it can get really difficult to make the decision, but I think in theory, it's pretty straightforward um, on those kinds of things. I think I'm next. Uh, the, uh, you have to make some distinctions here. Uh, a special permit is essentially evaluating an application in terms of uh, the uh, whether or not it complies with the objectives in the bylaw. And uh, that, uh, you know, that is very much a, a case by case basis. Special permits have a special status in law in that uh, they can actually be denied. And uh, so that, uh, there's a, a lot different as opposed to waivers and exceptions, which normally take the uh, come up in terms of, uh, for example, site plan review, where uh, it's 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 less consequential uh, often uh, and uh, easier to call than uh, on a uh, on a special permit. Uh, Basically, in any instance, they should be used in service of the public policy objectives of the bylaw. And, uh, you know, it's uh, I, the, the master plan is certainly uh, a, uh, uh, a uh, provides direction uh, for that. And the and then the bylaw itself, uh, I have a fair amount of experience doing this. Uh, uh, when I was on the board previously, and uh, I, I have a pretty clear idea as to how this can go forward. Thank you. Yeah. And Johanna. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, with regard to waivers and exceptions and special permits, um, I've been actually a little bit surprised at how these, these these do come up on the planning board business. They don't, and I, they don't, um, I've often been struck by how um, often it's not to thwart the intent of the zoning bylaw, but to make, to make something happen. So for example, there, are, I think on some of the big buildings or, you know, the buildings downtown, they needed a couple more feet in order to put um, equipment on top of the roof than was allowed. Johanna, excuse me, can you um, put yourself back in? And 
and we drop a whole story essentially during the and that's a spot where that's thank you okay sorry i don't know why the internet is being so fluky um but i think ultimately you have to look at yeah what what is the purpose why is the waiver being requested why is the exemption being requested and then you look at what would be the ramifications if it were not approved and what would be the ramifications if it were um and then you ultimately make a decision that is going to advance the policy objective most effectively and help move towards the master plan most effectively. Thank you. Um, okay, for um, my question, uh, the order will be uh, Joanna, then Jesse, and then Fred. And the question is, what is your approach to incorporating public, in, public input into your decision making? Great, thank you. Um, so let's see. Uh, I think I answered this a little bit on the front end. Public input is important to me. Um, I'm glad we have a public comment period at every meeting and I'm that is on issues relate unrelated to the agenda. And then also a public comment period on all the issues that are on the agenda. Um, I, you know, listen to those comments factor them into decision making. Um, I think that they are an important piece of the puzzle, but also um, need to be taken in context with the recommendation of staff and, you know, the conversation that happens on the board itself. Thank you. Um, and next to, for Jesse. Yeah, I agree with what Johanna said. I also think, um, Public input is fantastic. It's also really important to try and recognize that only certain people are able to attend meetings and make public comment. And so I don't know how currently the committees try and gather other opinions, but if there are mechanisms, I think that's always a great way to go um, to just gather as much input as possible. And then yes, the professionals and those chosen to be on the board just have to decide and weigh, weigh all the input right, if possible. Okay, thank you. And Fred. Well, uh, this is, uh, you know, public opinion has to, you know, public comments have to be taken very seriously uh, based on the arguments that are presented as part of those, uh, that, that comment process. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, pride myself on a willingness to be confused by the facts. And uh, this is uh, often that that comes from an argument that I did not anticipate. Uh, and you have to be open to that. And uh, but you also have to weigh that against the interest that the person may be uh, may bring to the table in the process of making the comment. So that's you have to do both. You ha you have to listen and and be willing to change your your mind, but you also have to know where the person's coming from who's making the comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um... We're going to be uh, responding in this order, Frederick, and then Jesse, and then Johanna. And the question is, what else do you bring? Would you like us to know about what makes you a strong candidate for the planning board? I I think uh, well, one of the things that I I bring to this process, and I do so as a very long term. Uh, resident uh, of Amherst uh, is the uh, a concept that was first presented to me by a historian many, many years ago. Uh, and that is that uh, we are stewards of the land, uh, that the land ultimately will outlive us. But while we're here, we are stewards of the land. And uh, I take that very seriously. Uh, 
I can identify uh, significant capital improvements to the properties that I've owned and where I live now uh, for, uh, you know, many, many decades. Uh, uh, that is something that I take very seriously and I would take it equally seriously as uh, coming back if I am selected to come back on the planning board. Thank you. Jesse? Thanks. Um, I think I would offer that I bring a lot of creativity. So in many roles, um, parts of my life, I find that I'm able to think outside the box and come up with solutions that are actually inside the box. So are, are not always obvious and that satisfy a lot of interests at the same time. Um, and yeah, I feel like that's a strength that, that I can definitely bring to the, to the committee. Thank you. Johanna? I feel like I've spent three years on the planning board learning and now I'm excited to build on that experience. Um, so I bring a dedication to making our town an even better place to live, work, and play. Um, and I like to think that I bring a spirit of open and thoughtful deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this is our last question. Um, and the order of answer will be Jesse, then Johanna, then Frederick. And it is, please confirm that you have the time to commit to meetings, hearings, and site visits. And if you're currently serving on any town boards or committees, do you see any conflict with serving on multiple boards? And can you manage the time commitment for all of them? Uh, Jesse. I don't serve on any other town boards at the moment. And yes, I believe I have the time to commit to the planning board. Thank you, Jesse. Johanna. I also do not serve on any other town committees. Um, there are times when it's a stretch, but mostly it works. Thank you. And Frederick. Uh, yeah, I uh, am retired. Uh, I have uh, a reasonably flexible schedule, and so I do not anticipate uh, any problems uh, meeting the, uh, the, uh, re the time requirements of the board. And I do not serve on any other board uh, or committee in Amherst presently, so there, there, there is no conflict there and I can manage the time required for the planning board. Thank you. Uh, we're going to, I'm gonna now ask the CRC members if they have, we're gonna do the same order. So Jesse, Johanna, and then Frederick. So are there any follow-up questions from CRC members for Jesse? Um, if there are, just somehow raise your hand or get my attention. Pat. Yes, Jesse, um, you uh, said for number three, uh, describe how the planning board can achieve its goals. And you stated quite clearly that you lack the experience of the planning board. Um, and I believe me, I understand that. Um, what I'm interested in is if you had a chance to look at the master plan and reflect on the master plan and what aspects of it feel important to you or resonate with you in some way. Um, yes, I, I did uh, not a very deep read, but yes, I, I looked over the master plan. Um, I think what resonated most is sort of keeping the quality of the town and at the same time uh, allowing development. And uh, the conversations come up a couple times of the reality of what's needed today, because that's constantly changing. And, you know, a, a, a even if it's a living document, a master plan might not always evolve as quickly as what the real needs, the practical needs are for success of the town in all aspects of the define that. So does that answer your question? I think so. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pat and Jesse. Uh, are there any other follow-up questions for Jesse from committee members? I am seeing head shakes of no and no hands. So we will move on to if there are any follow up questions for Johanna. Are there, do the committee members have any follow up questions for Johanna? Jennifer. Well, I had a question. It, could a question be related to something in the statement of interest, or does it just have to be to the 
No, you you may base something off the statement of interest too. Yeah. Okay, so I I did have a question, um, Johanna. In your statement of interest, you had said over the course of your first term on the planning board, you deliberated and voted on projects that increase housing near downtown and UMass, including projects in neighborhoods often averse to change. I was wondering what you meant by that. Good question. Um, so I'm thinking about specifically like the Olympia Drive, um, developments and the buildings downtown. And there were definitely abutters to downtown who expressed concern about the design elements of those buildings and the massive of those buildings. Um, yeah, so that's what I was referring to. Jennifer? Oh, you. oh can you hear me? Yeah. No, again, yeah. uh, no. Uh, thank you for the response. Yep. Are there any other follow up questions for Johanna? Seeing none. Um, next is Frederick. Uh, are there any follow up questions for Frederick? Uh, Shalini, was that a hand raised? Sure, yes. Um, and this was with respect to the question. Please describe considerations and object objectives you'll use for considering proposed revisions to the zoning bylaws. And uh, Frederick, I heard you, I love the Joni Mitchell code. Uh, and I heard you uh, emphasize the sense of history, which I think is an important aspect of a master plan as well. But could you speak a little more, how, because that was the main focus of your response. And if you could speak to what, what does history mean to you in terms of how you're gonna make decisions? Is it the number of years a building has been in place or like what, you know, what did, what would be the criteria within history that you would take into account, and especially if the sense of history is conflicting with an urgent need, let's say for affordable housing, or like how you know what what were the criteria you would use in that situation, or what you were thinking about? Well, that's a that's a, a very good question, and. Um... For example, uh, if you're if you're looking at a special permit, uh, there are rules about uh, the application being uh, and the and the proposal being consistent with the uh, prevailing architecture and so forth in the in the particular area. Um, and on the other hand, we have uh, again. I, I heard someone talk about urgent needs, and 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 they are there. And uh, one of the things that uh, that I would bring to this would be um, to try and be creative about how to craft uh, something that is uh, consistent with the neighborhood and still advances. Uh, a need for, for example, for additional housing. Uh, and uh, I happen to have over 50 years of experience as a landlord. And uh, if you're going to solve the problems of uh, 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 housing in general, uh, a key component of that is going to be uh, rental occupancies. And uh, I have a lot of experience uh, with managing those and, and doing so uh, very successfully. Uh, and uh, so I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, it's a, uh, 
you have to be very creative uh, in order, but it, I, I have found ways to, to, to do this that uh, advance the, uh, the goal that we want of uh, more additional housing without uh, sacrificing the, uh, the livability of a neighborhood. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's something that uh, I would take very seriously. Thank you, appreciate the answer. Thank you. Are there any other follow-up questions for Frederick? Seeing none, um, I, I believe we are going to, we've completed the interviews. I wanna say thank you to all of the applicants for um, joining us today and completing the SOIs, completing the, um, your, you know, submitting a statement of interest, having interest in serving on the planning board. Um, some of you having served on the planning board in the past, um, currently or or a while ago, and being willing to come back um, and 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 serve again, we appreciate you work working with us to go through this process, to be here today, to answer these questions and all. Um, we have completed the interviews. What will happen next is I'm going to, as host of this Zoom meeting, move you into the audience um, as we move into deliberations. Um, we will. Um, potentially make recommendations today to the council. The Whatever vote we take today will not be um, in front of the council until June 26th. Uh, there is a council meeting tonight, but our recommendation does not fall under the um, ability to hear at the council meeting that recommendation tonight. Um, we always do our best to minimize the time in between those recommendations and the vote at the council. It doesn't always work. Um, so there will be two weeks there, but um, sometime tonight or tomorrow, depending on timing, um, I will be in touch with each of you to let you know what the recommendation vote is, um, but it won't be heard at the council and whatever it is and whatever the council decides won't happen until June 26th. Um, so there'll be some time in there where that happens, but you'll at least know what our committee has recommended to the council by tomorrow. Um, if we recommend appointment and the council votes whatever our recommendation is, no appointment will take, well, the appointments will be effective July 1. Um, and so so that's that's why we're, we're getting it done in June. Um, the appointments become effective July 1. Um, are there any questions from the applicants at this time before I start moving you all into the attendees section? Seeing none, I'm gonna start moving you all in. And once I've done that, we're as a committee um, going to start our deliberations. You're welcome to stay because it's an open meeting, but you don't have to. <laughs> that is your choice once I've moved you in. Um, Thank you. I think that oh wait, Johanna Newman, here we go. So I think. That leaves the committee members as panelists. So we are now moving on to discussion of our interviews and applications um, and a potential vote on recommendation. Um, before we get into the discussion, I just wanna remind our committee, we have three potential openings. We have three committee members on the currently on the planning board whose terms are expiring, one of whom we just heard from has reapplied. Um, so we have two, we, we may recommend up to three individuals for those spots for three-year terms. Um, I'm going to summarize sort of the selection criteria that we have adopted before we get into conversation, just to remind us of, of what that selection guidance was, um, and then we will begin discussion. So the selection guidance um, has two parts, an input from the body's chair and criteria for a healthy and effective multiple member body. The criteria for a healthy and effective multiple member body um, from the council is a strong base of seasoned members and a group of newer members who have served less than one term, as well as members who reflect the diversity of the town's residents. Uh, on the input from the body's chair, which is the planning board's chair, Doug Marshall, um, we received some input that said his 
Minimum qualifications include being fair and open-minded, willing to reconsider previous positions, um, a team player willing to collaborate and compromise, um, committed to attending nearly all board meetings, willing to review the meeting packets, attend site visits, and otherwise prepare, and a positive attitude about advancing and balancing Amherst's multiple development goals um, as described in the master plan through the planning board process. The preferred qualifications from the chair are analytic reasoning, a clear and concise communication style, an ability to read design and construction drawings, a professional experience in related fields, and he went to list them, an understanding of the town system of governance, uh, boards and committees, and the ability to contribute to the geographic, economic, age, employment, and length of residency diversity. So that's a summary of our adopted selection criteria. Um, thoughts on the applicants and um, possible vote recommendations. I'm going to open up the floor at this time to that. I can't hear you, Pat. Yeah, that's because I'm trying to make up my mind whether I want to speak. <laughs> Your mouth was moving, so I thought you were saying something and just hadn't pressed the microphone. Well, I kind of was, but I was. Uh, um, uh, I I, I want to speak uh, to and about Jesse. Um, you know, both Johanna and Fred Frederick bring a great deal of experience, um, and Jesse is not experienced uh, on planning board. And his answers were short. Um, and But rereading his statement of interest I, and some of the things that he said in his answers makes me uh, really want to support him as a candidate. Um, he, in his uh, statement of interest, he talked about owning rental property. Um, and it's a long-term investment for him. But he also, as you read through and um, absorb his statement of interest, he talks about uh, that long-term investment being, or I'm hearing it as being about people, uh, not profit necessarily. Uh, and that's refreshing. Uh, he's also the only person who brought up any issues about diversity. Um, in in his answers, and I don't have right here the quote that I wanted to use, um, but he's really looking to support families and year-round residents to and to encourage them to move into Amherst. That's already a slightly different perspective. Instead of how do we keep them here, how do we also draw them in? And I feel like he was very honest. Um, about his values in terms of um, I have of living downtown on purpose, living in a dense area on purpose. Um, and, and I'll say more in a minute. Uh, I just feel like there's something there that I feel are, is missing or was missing for me in terms of the other two candidates who, who I think are good also, but in a very different way. So I'm going to encourage us to take a risk on Jesse, um, and I'll probably say something else later. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to take a shot at it? Jennifer. Oh, Let Pam, she raised her hand. Pam and then Jennifer. Okay, while we're uh, discussing Jesse Major, I would say that I appreciate someone who is able to negotiate and lead a faculty organization or faculty and staff organization, which comes with all of the um, inherent interests of each and every one of the, the people whose research is impacted or whose funding, you know, is to be discussed. And uh, it is it is not an easy course, and I think someone who's been successful in managing that first and foremost is a good listener, and I think that's that's a characteristic and a skill that um, I think is 
pretty critical. Thank you, Pam. Jennifer. Um, yeah, speaking of uh, Jesse, I agree with what Pat and Pam said. Um, I was, I, I actually hadn't realized I knew he was a biology, a veterinary animal biology professor, but hadn't realized he had the background in architecture and urban planning. So yeah, I think um, that's terrific. And yeah, and I was really impressed. I can't imagine anything more where people hold more passionately held positions than on animal research. And knowing that you're not going to reach consensus, but that everybody has to feel that they were heard and considered. That's, I, I was impressed by that statement. That's it. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take a, a turn. Um, I, I was impressed by all of the statements of interest and, and also the answers to all of the questions. And, and I thank our, the three committee members who asked follow-up questions. Those were very helpful too um, in drawing out some additional answers. Um, in, in looking at the selection criteria, um, I, would, I would vote to recommend and probably support recommending all three. Um, they all have different strengths and weaknesses, and and you know I, I can see where there might be some concern about Jesse because of a, a, an appearance of lack of experience. But I actually think back to um, Johanna when when we made the recommendation three years ago to appoint Johanna, who at that time did not have a lot of zoning and planning experience. Um, and, and when we look at our selection guidance, um, it, we're supposed to have a good mix of experienced and newer members. And with two of our three candidates right now um, having experience um, and the current four members on the planning board, um, three of whom have at least you know, I, I went back and looked, we, our current members who are continuing on were appointed in either 2019, 2020, or 2022. Two of them were 2022, but one of them had served on the planning board previously. So we really have a lot of experienced members and not as many of the, what, what I think our selection guidance would call newer members. And so I think adding in a newer member or two would be beneficial um, to uh, the board as a whole. Um, so, so um, in in that sense, I I think I found them all fairly open minded and fair in terms of the, the, their answers to the questions, and also I I felt like all of the all of the candidates um, generally meet our selection criteria in various ways, um, such that I could support recommending all of them to appointment. Jennifer. Yeah, so I didn't know if we were going to be going around through each candidate, but um, I, I have to be, you know, just, I, I feel like I have to say this because I've been really, um, I have some, I found on uh, both in terms of, of from zooming into many planning board meetings over the last three years, and also the statement of interest that I, I do have concerns. Um, I, I felt like the statement that, um, you know, uh, that neighborhoods that are averse to change feels divisive to me. And it doesn't um, just seem, it's not just a difference of opinion. It's characterizing some neighborhoods as averse to change. And I have to say the response, um, I don't think those are neighborhoods averse to change if what was being thought of were the buildings downtown, because there aren't a lot, I mean, those, there aren't a lot of residents before those buildings went up. There weren't people living downtown. So they weren't the residents of the downtown. I mean, I think there were, I know at one point there was a moratorium um, petition that went out that had like 900 signatures for people all over Amherst. So, um, and then, you know, I've heard in planning board meetings, she sometimes refers to transitional neighborhoods, which I can't help thinking are some of the neighborhoods in my district, which um, feels always feels a little um, derogatory or condescending. I'm not sure what that means. So um, I just, I was concerned about, I felt in the statement of interest that that was, it felt um, a little divisive and accusatory to me. So I'm, I'm struggling with that. Thank you, Jennifer. Pam. Yeah, that's actually good. Um impetus for me to, to speak up as well. Um, when I was listening to Johanna's um, 
response to number two, which is the conflict and controversial decisions. Um, the very nice statement was made that process that process is key, meaning we discuss it, we get it out there. Um, but I, I am trying to remember <laughs> back, I also have listened to more planning board meetings than I wish. Um, and I and I wish that there had in fact been initiated by Johanna Newman more discussion of the pros and cons of projects. And I was typically very surprised that it was usually a, a fairly carte blanche acceptance of what was being proposed with, um, with little discussion about um, what could be improved to a project. I mean, we can we can always get projects, but they can always be they can always be serve the the public better. They can serve the open space better. They can serve the goals in the master plan better. And I and I missed hearing that aspect just specifically from Johanna Newman. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Any other comments and thoughts? Pat. Yeah, I'm again debating, but I, um, since Johanna brought up the solar moratorium, I sort of need to speak to that a little bit. Uh, her interpretation of it um, making, letting the world know that Amherst wasn't supportive of solar development is an in, uh, inaccurate um, interpretation of what the moratorium was about, it was about slowing down so that we could create a solar bylaw so that we would have guidelines. And I remember very strongly the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals desperately reaching out to the planning board to say, we need some kind of guidelines. Um, and I wanna state, I was a main, one of the main supporters of the moratorium, so I don't, so it's a little funny to be doing this, but I, I again heard um, interpretations that puzzled me because it wasn't about protecting open green space. It was about using forests in a primary role to sequester carbon and perhaps putting limits on uh, having solar development in a forested area that was limited that wouldn't take up 80 acres, but would take up a smaller uh, amount. There was also a great um, uprising of public opinion in support of forest sequestration. Uh, so it doesn't seem like that was taken into account. Uh, and thank goodness for our governor, although I'm mad at her for other things, um, she's talking about preserving forests. Um, and I, don't know where the solar bylaw group is with that, but the, initially they started off uh, wanting to not necessarily save forests because it was a social justice issue. And so to me, it was a real lack of um, insight into what forests do and a lack of imagination on the part of the committee working um, so I have real problems and I will not be able to support Johanna uh, to remain on the planning board. Thank you, Pat. Any other thoughts? Shalini, you have been quiet. Do you wish to say anything or do you wish to remain quiet? I'm just taking in all these different points of view and um just um contemplating the especially around the solar issue and i mean it is interesting to me because that is johanna's primary work in terms of um, environmental advocacy so it is kind of ironic that that is uh, the issue that Pat you're raising against her, and um, 
but I understand you're raising it because you heard her disagree for reasons that you're saying are not what um, what the solo moratorium was about. And and I'm wondering if we need to clarify from Johannes what her statement meant, because I didn't take it to mean what. Uh, you are understanding uh, because I also am totally in favor of the solar bylaws and uh, but I felt having spoken with the UMass group and having spoken with the staff and that there like while the solar bylaw is being written there are processes in place that can make sure that we continue so i'm just saying that there's like a there might be some um uh disconnect between what was said by her and how we are perceiving this so is that something we need to clarify before we decide based on our interpretation of what was said so we have closed the interview section of the meeting um, and everyone was offered the chance to ask follow up questions, so um, I would be hesitant to reopen the interview portion of the meeting. Um, because I'm not sure it would fall within policy or necessarily be equitable at this point. Um, um, I if people disagree, <laughs> that can always be a, a, a trying to overrule the decision of the chair. Um, but uh, that's that would be my decision at this point is we're we've closed the interviews um, and it would be inappropriate to reopen them at this time. Um, so. Uh, Other thoughts? Mm, could we invite, I mean, maybe not now because we've closed, but could we invite a clarification from the candidate about what? Because I don't I think that's appropriate. So that would be, I would take that to be the same, at least at this time during this meeting, to be mm -hmm. the same as reopening the interview process. Obviously, um when whatever our recommendations are go to the council um there we have seen in the past plenty of public comment on our recommendations including comments from um candidates um during mm -hmm. the public comment okay. phase of the meetings where the rep recommendations go um so that I, that that could be a place where things could happen if people choose if candidates or other residents choose to make comments at that time based on the recommendations we make. Okay, so yeah, as long as people have, uh, because I don't think even, I don't think that question was asked for clarification while the thing was open and we're making that statement now. So just, I think it would be great in the future if he did, like that would have been a great, clarification question uh, to ask the candidate while we were still with the candidates. It was chosen not to be asked and, and that is okay. Um, so Pam. Yeah, I just wanted to respond that that you know, this is based on uh, all the different facts, including statements in this in the statement of interest. And so I, you know, I think um, it, this is not an exhaustive interview process, um, and I think I think we've we've covered the bases pretty well. I did want to speak um, just for a second, since we've talked about the two other candidates. I would like to um, state that I'm very excited that someone like Fred Hartwell is interested in coming back on the planning board. I think the ability to review. Uh, detailed zoning bylaws and the ramifications, as he said, are really important. That's that's what it's all about because there's so many interconnected pieces of zoning that it really takes somebody to be able to pick them apart and understand which pieces um, affect something else. So I, I really appreciate the fact that 
that he's coming out of retirement to uh, to step back to the planning board, and I would support him. Thank you, Pam. Jennifer. Yeah, I um, I guess in, in terms of Fred, he he kind of he brings so much. Uh, he having been on, lived at Amherst a long time, uh, he's a longtime uh, landlord. Uh, that he, you know, is so in, that he is an electrician by training and serves on licensing boards, um, you know, and his past experience on the board, um, he kind of seems to have the whole package. So that's exciting. And that he, as Pam said, is willing to come out of retirement to serve again. Any other comments, thoughts? See none at this time. Um, I we have done motions in various manners before. Um, we have three potential vacancies, um, and we have at this point three applicants. So I'm going to make the well. People can make motions any way they want. I, I was going to make motions, and what I was going to do was make a motion to recommend each of the candidates separately. So three separate motions at this time. Um, since there are three candidates, um, instead of if we had six candidates, that might be a little harder to go one by one, um, but we have three. So that was going to be my plan. Um, if anyone wants to make different motions than what I make um, beyond the plan I just stated to make the motions, um, and we'll see where they fall, please let me know. But I will start with, and, and they're all going to sound the same, and then we will take the votes. Um, so let me get my notes. Sorry, I'm I'm make, writing my motion down so that I can just read it each time. Okay, we're gonna take them in alphabetical order. So I am going to move to, a, sorry, I got my mouth ahead of me. Um, move to recommend the town council appoint Frederick Hartwell to the planning board for a term beginning July 1, 2023 and ending June 30, 2026. Is there a yeah. second? Uh, second. Help. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I will roll call that vote. Um, we are going to start with, we're just going to start with Shalini. Yes. Pat? Aye. Mandy is an aye. Pam? Aye. And Jennifer? Aye. That motion passes five to zero unanimously. The second motion is a motion to, um, to recommend the town council appoint Jesse Major to the planning board for a term beginning July 1, 2023 and ending June 30, 2026. Um, is there a second? Second, Rooney. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Pat. Aye. Mandy is an aye. Pam. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. And Shalini? Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Um, the third motion is a motion to recommend the town council reappoint Johanna Newman to the planning board for a term beginning July 1, 2023 and ending June 30, 2026. Is there a second to that motion? Second, Shalini. Is there further discussion on it? Seeing no discussion, we will move to a vote. 
Um, Mandy is an I. Um, Pam. No. Jennifer. No. Shalini. Yes. And Pat. No. By my count, that motion to recommend fails. Um, two in favor, three opposed. Um, seeing that, um, that means we will be, I will report all three out um, and I will report that that means the council has recommended, uh, well, the, not the council, we're not the council. The Community Resources Committee um, is making a recommendation that would leave one seat on the planning board open um, for the time being. Is there any other, let me look at my agenda. Are there any other um, uh, comments, questions under planning board appointments at this time? Seeing none, we will move to announcements. Um, I do not have any announcements at this time. Um, does anyone else have any announcements? Seeing none, I do not have any items not anticipated, anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance. Um, does anyone else have unanticipated items? Seeing none, that takes care of our agenda. I am going to adjourn this special meeting of the Community Resources Committee at 5.52 p.m. We will see all of you at 6.30 for the regular council meeting. Thank you. Thank you.